25 years ago today, October 26th, 1895, the North Carolina football team played a game against the University of Georgia Bulldogs in Atlanta. It was the beginning of a four-game and six-day period for the Tar Heels, squaring off against Vanderbilt, Sewanee, and bookended by contests against the Bulldogs. What might today seem like a pointless recanting of a primitive contest, so different from the present game that we all know and love, is actually a uniquely knotted tapestry of fact, folklore, and famous names that all center around the game's first forward pass. I'm Joey Powell, and on this edition of The Backstory from InsideCarolina.com, we'll look at how an unlikely reflexive decision by a Tar Heel football player would change the game forever. In 1895, Thomas Doggy Trenchard was named head coach for the University of North Carolina football team, just two years removed from an All-American playing career at Princeton. They opened the season with a 36 to nothing throttling of North Carolina A&M, now known as NC State, followed by a 34 to nothing shutout of Richmond a week later. Both games took place in Chapel Hill prior to the team embarking on a series of games in Georgia and Tennessee. The first stop, a game at Piedmont Park in Atlanta against the Georgia Bulldogs. UGA was coached by a young man who just finished coaching his first stint at Iowa State just weeks prior, Glenn Scobie Warner. History would remember him as Pop. The season would also be the first for a group of schools unified under what was called the Southern Intercollegiate Athletic Association, which was founded by Dr. William Dudley, a professor at Vanderbilt. Original members of this group of schools included Alabama, Auburn, Georgia, Georgia Tech, North Carolina, Sewanee, and Vanderbilt. The conference's original charter stated that its creation was for the development and purification of college athletics throughout the South. The game kicked off at 3.30 with the Carolinians captained by Ed Gregory. After subsequent minimal gains by Harris Collier and John Allen Moore, North Carolina was forced to punt. But this is only the beginning of where the game becomes lore and the stuff of ages. Punting had been an official part of the game for a short period of time, as teams typically employed various types of kicks and drop kicks as strategy. However, the spiral punt had just been developed over a dozen years prior by a kicker at Princeton. The tactic was a far cry from how fans recognize it in the current game. It should also be noted that there are varying accounts for what happened next. I consulted with Tar Heel football historian Lee Pace who's perhaps the most knowledgeable person on the subject for this podcast, and we're going to believe that his version is the truth. So here are the Tar Heel footballers preparing to punt the ball away to Georgia in the early stages of a tie game. Captain Ed Gregory is prepared to punt from deep in the Tar Heel end zone. Fearing the oncoming rush of the Georgia defense, Gregory sprinted out to his right to avoid the pressure. Then, rather than the planned punt and what was likely a fit of reaction to the rush, Gregory heaved the ball either forward, skyward, or otherwise. Regardless of what it looked like getting airborne, the ball floated to left halfback George Stevens, who advanced it some 70 yards for a touchdown. After quarterback Joel Whitaker kicks the extra goal, Carolina led 6 to nothing, with only four minutes gone in the game. Seems pretty simple, right? Well, in a hearty twist of irony, the referee claimed that he hadn't seen the pass and allowed the play to stand. Different tellings from those who were there hint that it looked as if someone knocked the ball out of Ed Gregory's hand before Stevens caught it. Some accounts even tell it as an accident. Either way, Georgia coach Pop Warner made every effort and protest that he found possible to have the play thrown out and the score overturned. The touchdown would remain, however, as the referee was adamant that he just did not see it. Somewhere in here is a joke about referees being awful, even in the 19th century. All nuance aside, the play in question would be the only scoring on the day. North Carolina would hold on for a 6 to nothing victory. From the Daily Tar Heels recap, The playing was by no means as good as the score seems to indicate. Our boys had traveled all the night, getting hardly any sleep, and this, together with the fact that many were suffering from previous injuries, must account for the poor showing they made. The Georgia team was a good one, somewhat heavier than ours, and in better physical condition. For Carolina, Stevens and Moore did the best work. The article then closes, No one was seriously injured, 
which I found to be quite humorous, if not morbid. That Tar Heel team would go on to a 7-1-1 and record, their only loss, a 10-6 defeat to Virginia to end the season, which gave UVA the Southern Championship. The months and years that followed that game between Georgia and Carolina would go on to ripple throughout the college football world, as key contributors and witnesses to the dubious forward pass would create impact for decades to come. For example, among the crowd that day was one John Heisman. Heisman had just been tabbed the coach of Auburn University that year, but was in Atlanta and witnessed the game in person. He would eventually become one of the major proponents of legalizing the forward pass. In 1906, college football was facing extinction simply due to the rash of violent injuries and fatalities that plagued the sport. President Teddy Roosevelt even got involved, and at the urging of many noted college football personalities at the time, the Rules Committee, led by Walter Camp, adopted a new set of rules to, quote, minimize the danger of the sport. Among those rule changes, the legalization of the forward pass. Lots of college football influencers, including Camp, felt that the forward pass would reduce the game's violent nature, and that held up adopting the rule for many years. Heisman would go on to a prolific career as a football coach at Auburn, Clemson, Georgia Tech, and Rice, among other schools. He also coached baseball and basketball. He would also write quite a bit about the sport, and in his 1921 book, The Principles of Football, he would retell the story of the illegal forward pass from his vantage point. However, he incorrectly retold the story of North Carolina's use of the play as having been a pass from Joel Whitaker to George Stevens. It is true that Whitaker was the team's quarterback at the time, but he was not the player who threw the pass. George Stevens would confirm to the Asheville Citizen many years later that Ed Gregory was in fact the passer. Now, here's a bit of follow-up for some of the key names in the story. Walter Camp would become known by many as the father of American football. A player, coach, and writer, Camp would annually publish his own All-American team. He died in 1925, having written over 250 articles and two dozen books about the sport. Many of the aspects of modern football are attributed to Camp's ingenuity. He was a member of the inaugural class of the College Football Hall of Fame. John Heisman coached until 1927, when he went on into athletic administration. He's credited with the creation of hiking the football, shifting offensive players before the snap, and the hidden ball play. Two months after his death in 1936, the annual trophy awarded by the Downtown Athletic Club to college football's top player was renamed to Bear Heisman's name, a name that it still carries today. He was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame in 1954 as part of the second class of inductees. Pop Warner left Georgia after two seasons, the second of which involved his team using the first onside kick in the South. Warner went on to win four national titles at various schools, coaching until he was 68 years old. He's remembered as an innovator, credited with the creation of the wing formation, the three-point stance, and other parts of the game. He joined Walter Camp and others in the inaugural class of the CFB Hall. As for the Tar Heel Warriors, well, Joel Whitaker, the team's quarterback from Warrington, would later become one of the first head football coaches at Guilford College and a successful ophthalmologist. University historian at the time, Kent Plummer Battle, proclaimed Whitaker the university's best all-around athlete, as Whitaker was a star in both football and baseball. Captain Ed Gregory was also a great second baseman in baseball, in addition to being the star left in and halfback on the gridiron for North Carolina. For a long time, he held the record at UNC for the most extra points attempted in a game via kick at eight. And finally, from Summerfield, George Stevens, the receiver of the infamous pass, would become a journalist, insurance salesman, and real estate guru, among other things. According to Lee Pace, Stevens originally came to UNC to run the intramural basketball program after studying under one Dr. James Naismith at the Springfield, Massachusetts YMCA. Later in life, Stevens was the publisher at the Charlotte Observer, the owner-publisher of the Asheville Citizen newspaper. He's also credited with playing a major role in the creation and development of the Myers Park area of Charlotte. So there you have it, a quirky but often untold bit of history from Tar Heel football that would forever change the game. And while you may have once heard bits and pieces of this tale, now you know the backstory.
If you'd like to learn more about this story, be sure to search Inside Carolina's online archives. Special thanks to Lee Pace for his insight and help, and to Johnny T-Shirt for their support of this podcast. For InsideCarolina.com, I'm Joey Powell. I'll catch you next time.